I'm here with Evan Osnos. He's the author of Age of Ambition, Chasing Fortune, Truth, and Faith in the New China and winner of the National Book Award. Congratulations. Thank and you hello much. again. Thank you. Yeah, it's nice Th to be back this here. was, uh, I know, the culmination of many years of your work in China for The New Yorker. What were, you, what were you trying to come to terms with after those years there? Trying to get my arms around it. Yeah. And this is the challenge on China. It is this vast story. It's this epical story in the sense that you do sense when you're there, yo, you're changing from a village but had gone on and gotten a great education. Mm -hmm. Her parents couldn't introduce her to the right kind of people. She started a company. The company succeeded. She made $77 million by the time that I, <laughs> by the time I'd left China. And in its own way, that's a sort of, uh, in some ways it's a kind of familiar story as yeah. an American. Yeah, I mean, yeah, this yeah. is sort of what we've done in our own history. Right. And yet it's also not the whole story. It's one tiny piece of a story. And there are all kinds of people in China who are trying to get on that train and are not getting on that train. They're not getting that kind of piece of the big story. And so capturing both of those in one portrait was the goal of this. Yeah, book. and so that creates the kind of splits in a society that we're familiar with more in our society, mm -hmm. but you were seeing it happen in real time, real fast. Hugely, yeah. I mean, yeah. in China, of course, we talk about the, the gap between rich and poor in the United States. Yeah. In China, they talk about it. The, 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 the numbers are even larger in China. I mean, the difference between the poorest places and the richest places mm -hmm. is the difference between Ghana and New York City. And, you know, this is the People's Republic of China. This is the place that is, after all, still ruled by the Chinese Communist Party. And that creates a daily drumbeat of uh, at best, cognitive dissonance, and at worst, a sense that there's something hypocritical going on, and people are trying to kind of get their minds around that. When we have talked on the news hour over the years, it is usually because of something that the government has done, right, at a high level. Uh, one, the subtitle is the or the title, Age of Ambition. Mm -hmm. Now, what is the ambition, uh, as you look back or as you think about it now broadly, the ambition of China? Well, there's a national ambition, a yeah. collective, in a sense, political ambition, which I think is the thing we see from far away. That's the fact that China is building roads and airports and extending its reaches out into the East China Sea and the South China Sea and in a way that's putting it into some tension with its neighbors. That's the thing I think we feel from far away, but I think the, one of the interesting facts of living there, and this is certainly one of the things that is essential to this book, is that there is a second ambition, and it's the one that is just beneath the surface, and it's the one felt by 1.4 billion Chinese people, and each of them in their own way is defining what that aspiration is. So it's interesting. Today, the mm -hmm. Chinese government talks about the Chinese dream. This is the current slogan of the moment. Right. And it sounds like, OK, I get what the Chinese dream it sounds right. a little like the American yeah, it's dream. It's a little like that was something we all grew up with. Right. right? Yeah. And, and mm -hmm. there's energy in that idea. Yeah. The difference, however, is that when the Chinese government talks about the Chinese dream, they're talking about a single idea that they are offering to people. It's about the, the renewal of the country, the return of China to greatness. But actually, on an individual level all across the country, people are interpreting their own life trajectory on their own terms. And that's an, inter that's an inherent contradiction in a way. Are most of them interpreting in, term in, in, in money terms, financial terms, economic terms, that kind of ambition? I think they start with it in financial terms. Yeah. The first yeah. thing people want is finally, after all these years of deprivation, they want to get rich. Right. Um, but once they get rich, they realize there's all these other things that they need. Yeah. So they want information, for instance. Right. And they don't want information for abstract reasons. You know, when you buy a house and you get a car and you finally get these things, right. you realize they're not really secure. They're not safe. Somebody could knock down your house if you don't understand who's setting the rules in your society, who's breaking the rules in your society. Right. Um, so that creates Which is still happening all the, all the time in China, yeah. So that creates that appetite for information. And but, but, the, but, the, but the bargain that we keep, we've always talked about and heard about mm -hmm. with China is, the, is still that strong government, mm -hmm. right? We will give you security. Mm -hmm in exchange, but we will not give you, and we will give you economic entitlement or yeah. empowerment, yeah. but not freedom of expression, mm -hmm. say, sure. or, free or privacy. Right, and this gets harder. Mm -hmm. You know, as people begin to get further away from the worst years, you know, it's, it's easy to forget that in our lifetime, Chinese people have suffered through terrible things. I mean, there was famine, there was political violence of mm -hmm. a kind that is very foreign to us in the United States. Um, but what amounted to effectively civil war during the Cultural Revolution mm -hmm. in the 1960s and 70s. So for the first years of the economic development, this period, this extraordinary economic development that began in the late 70s, mm -hmm. people were willing to mortgage a whole lot of other things because they were finally, for the first time, feeling like they had enough food on the table, they could mm -hmm. uh, put their kids into a decent school. Those kinds of satisfactions no longer satisfy, in a way, and people now say, well, what more? What else? What I want a richer life. And so that's when they begin to say, well, 
how do I bring a court case in a way that I feel is fair? And how do I achieve mm -hmm. justice in the system? Mm -hmm. and so it's this kind of thickening of what people consider to be a good life. Well, how much, do, how, how much is it growing? Because, I mean, we certainly see that in individual cases, mm -hmm. right? Certain people get a lot of attention, whether they're human rights lawyers or an Ai Weiwei as an sure. artist. But what about the aspirations more broadly of people? Do you, do you, do you actually see? Yeah, what you yeah? see is interesting. People will go out of their way to mm -hmm. avoid being political. Because being political in China is a very dangerous thing to choose to do. And it's very, still, it's still very yeah. much so. I mean, in, I mean, we've talked about it before, and I've written about it in this book, that I spent a lot of time with dissidents over the years. Right. And in, in, invariably, if you ask somebody, why did you become a dissident? They'll say, well, I'm not a dissident. And I say, well, you are living under house arrest, and you have been in a confrontation with the government for right. five years. But it's because the idea of dissent is still radioactive in people's minds. So they don't choose willingly to go down a political path. What happens is that the facts of their lives almost compel them in a direction of paying attention to mm -hmm. ideology, philosophy, and things like that. A and in the meantime, there's these continuing flashpoints like Hong Kong. Right, yeah. yeah. Hong Kong was a really interesting moment. It was an expression of a lot of these underlying forces that we're talking about. Mm -hmm. If you think about it, you had a generation of young people in Hong Kong who said, in effect, we're not sure what kind of China we want and how much we want to be a part of China. Mm -hmm. And then China was saying, congratulations, you're now a part of the People's Republic. And the people in Hong Kong were saying, but hold on, what are the terms of that deal? And, that, and they brought it out into the streets in a very visible way. And, and, and just finally, I mean, you're now in Washington, right? Yeah. Do you, <laughs> how do they compare? <laughs> and it do you look wistfully or do you look, you still cover it, you're still following what happens in China? I, I guess, still follow it pretty, pretty closely. Yeah. But I now do, I, I mean, I lead this sort of div divided life where yeah. I write about American politics and foreign affairs. Yeah. And then I keep an eye on China very closely. And the experience of going from one capital to the other has been um, something I'll probably write about in the pages of The New Yorker at some point. But it has been, um, it's been harder than I thought, to be honest. I mean, I spent really? years overseas. I spent 11 years abroad. Yeah. And on all these years, I would talk about, well, I know that we've got our sort of political problems at home, but have faith in the United States Congress. It'll, it'll prevail in the end. And then I come home, and the very first thing that happens, the very first day of work in the US, was the day the government shut down last fall. And I sort of had to recalibrate the instruments yeah. right away. Welcome home. Yeah, exactly. I have a lot <laughs> to learn. All right, the book is Age of Ambition. Evan Osnos, thanks so much. Thanks very much.